Hello, my name is Violeta Politov, and this PowerPoint presentation is a summary of research into Australian print media coverage of violence against women. This research was conducted in collaboration with Professor Jenny Morgan from the University of Melbourne Law School and with the generous support of the Victorian Health Promotion Foundation, or Vic Health. I'd like to begin this presentation by giving an overview of the issue of men's violence against women, then moving into a discussion of our key research findings. I'll be concluding with some recommendations. Firstly, it's important to point out that violence against women and girls is not confined to any particular political or economic system. It transcends boundaries of wealth, race, and culture. The UN estimates that globally up to 70% of women experience violence in their lifetime. In the Australian context, Vic Health has found that more than one in three women have experienced physical violence since the age of 15. And almost every week a woman in Australia is killed by a partner or ex-partner. In terms of gender, it's sometimes suggested that men and women are equally violent and that this issue isn't gender-based. However, the statistics reveal that this is not the case, with Victorian police quoting that 77% of reported family violence victims and 89% of reported rape victims are women and girls. And the consequences of this are enormous. In terms of women's health, intimate partner violence contributes to more ill health and premature death in Victorian women under the age of 45 than any of the other risk factors, including high blood pressure, obesity, and smoking. And among the underlying causes of violence against women, we find the belief in rigid gender roles, weak support for gender equality, and persistent discrimination. Studies have consistently shown that violence against women and gender inequity are intrinsically linked. And in fact, the most common predictor of the use of violence among men is their agreement with sexist, patriarchal, and or host sexually hostile attitudes. So what's the role of community attitudes in the ongoing problem of violence against women? Community attitudes are important because they inform the perpetration of violence and shape both victims and community responses. Media is important here because they play a key role in the communication of information about matters of public importance and therefore have a role to play in how people understand issues like violence against women. Before going into our study, I want to set the scene and ask, what's the state of gender equity in journalism today? Firstly, a number of media monitoring projects have shown that the world represented through journalism tends to be a male world. In Australia, three out of four people named, heard, or seen in the news are male. And a recent UK report found that 84% of those mentioned or quoted in lead pieces are men. So who writes the news? A report by Women in Journalism found that in the UK, most front page articles are written by men, and in the Australian context, most reporters and news presenters are also men. And what about gender equity? How is this represented? According to the Global Media Monitoring Project, the issue is rarely discussed, and in fact, nearly half of all stories actually reinforce gender stereotypes. So these studies all remind us that we're actually still quite a long way from finding gender equity in contemporary newsrooms. So how is the specific issue of violence against women represented? In order to consider this question, we set some parameters, which I'll go through now. If you'd like to know more about our methodology, please see our technical report, which can be found on the Vic Health website, and is included in the reference list at the end of this presentation. In terms of our sample, we coded 2,452 articles from The Age and The Herald Sun, both Victorian newspapers. We looked at stories from three time periods between 1986 and 2008, and we included coverage of four types of violence against women, sexual violence, intimate partner homicide, non-intimate partner murder, and articles where the phrase violence against women or related phrase were used. In terms of our findings, I'll be offering today only a snapshot of what we found, so again, please see the full report if you'd like to know more. I'll be, f I'll be focusing on weaknesses of coverage, but I'd like to point out that after reviewing the international research on this issue, it is clear that Australian news media covers this issue much less problematically than a lot of its international counterparts, which is really excellent news. <laughs> 
But in spite of this, there's always room for improvement, and these are the areas I'll be focusing on in this presentation. Overall, our overarching finding was that coverage tended to lack context about the issue of violence against women. Most articles, 83% of articles in our sample, discussed violence against women as discrete or individual incidents or events, so they offered the basic who, what, when, where, rather than offering information about the broader social context or discussing wider patterns of violence against women. This means that stories tended to reinforce the idea that violence against women, and domestic violence in particular, are individual or family problems, rather than being part of a systemic social problem. We also found that very few articles, only 2%, included any information about support services. So unlike those stories about suicide or depression, which regularly cite a telephone number for Beyond Blue or Lifeline, stories about violence against women didn't include this kind of information. Not only would this information be useful to readers who may not know where to turn for support, but it would also be a quick and easy way for journalists to contextualize and label the violence. We also found there was a tendency to not mention the relationship between the victim and the perpetrator, which can leave readers with the impression that the violence was stranger-based. This reinforces the persistent idea that women are most at risk from strangers when, in fact, they're more likely to experience violence at the hands of a man who is known to her. And lastly, in terms of language, we also found that articles about intimate partner homicide rarely use the terms domestic violence or violence against women. So the language used to describe these incidents, again, doesn't label the violence for what it is. Another important area we investigated was the use of sources in coverage of violence against women. So who gets to speak about this issue? We found that the two main sources for stories were legal professionals and police. Of course, these are logical sources for stories about violence against women, especially in court reporting, but there are some issues with this. For example, often defense attorneys employ victim-blaming discourses in order to defend the accused, and police can have a tendency to focus on the individual elements of the case rather than discussing how the violence was part of a broader social problem. This could be balanced out by the use of violence against women experts and social workers. However, unfortunately, they are rarely used as sources. As you can see, we found that only 6% of articles cited someone working in the field of violence against women as a source. We believe this is an area which holds great potential. If we could increase the use of these sources in coverage of violence against women, then stories would be much more likely to include useful contextual information about the issue. Another key area of our research was the representation of stranger-based sexual violence or stranger danger. Much of the international research has suggested that coverage tends to over-report stranger rape and under-report acquaintance rape when compared to statistical measures. In Australia, 75% of sexual assaults are perpetrated by someone known to the victim. However, in our sample, only 41% of articles that, which discuss sexual assault mention a relationship between the victim and the perpetrator. This is likely to leave readers with the impression that stranger rapes are more common than they really are, and could leave women with misplaced fear in public spaces. I should mention that there are some legal restrictions faced by journalists when naming the perpetrator and the relationship could inadvertently mean naming the victim. In these cases, we suggest that in terms of useful coverage of the issue, it's better to name the relationship and not name and shame the perpetrator. In terms of blind spots of coverage, one topic is virtually invisible. The issue of sexual violence in the context of intimate partnerships is rarely covered. In Victoria, 13 to 19 percent of reported rapes are perpetrated by an intimate or ex-intimate partner. This is also an area that is notoriously underreported. In spite of this, we found that the issue is only mentioned or discussed in 4 percent of articles. And when you look at all of the articles about sexual violence in our sample, only three actually discuss the issue in any depth whatsoever. This is, this is certainly an area that, that appears to be underrepresented in the coverage.
Then, looking specifically at the representation of intimate partner homicide, we were interested in seeing to what degree prior violence was discussed or mentioned. In most cases where men kill their intimate or ex-intimate partners, the murder was preceded by domestic violence. We were interested in knowing to what degree this was represented in the coverage, particularly with the tendency for coverage to discuss acts of violence as discrete, rather than being part of an ongoing pattern. In our analysis, we found that only 17% mentioned prior violence. This suggests that incidents would appear more like random acts of violence than as part of an ongoing problem. And as mentioned previously, language could that could easily label the incident as a case of violence against women is rarely used. So I've included here an example of how this lack of context can manifest. In this news article we see that a man, Maxwell Keith Lehman, is charged with the murder of a woman who disappeared more than 16 years ago. Later on we read that Mrs. Lehman was reported missing from her home in 1969. Now, firstly, on reading this piece, neither Jenny nor I noticed that the man facing the murder charge had the same surname as the murdered woman. After researching this piece further, we found that they were in fact man and wife. However, the article does not mention this piece of information. And on a cursory read, actually, gives the impression that they may not have even known each other. This example offers some insight into how the omission of key information can indeed misrepresent the crime and the broader social problem of violence against women. Looking beyond the question of context, we were also interested in assessing the degree to which Australian news media might blame victims for the violence they experience. International research has found that victim blaming is relatively commonplace in news media coverage of violence against women. So we investigated this question and found that only 2% of articles in our sample actually included any explicit victim blaming. This is a really important finding and says a lot about the quality of Australian press. At the same time, when we expanded our definition of victim blaming to include descriptions of the victim's behavior which could subtly suggest she may have enabled the violence, the statistics went up to 22%. This means that 22% of articles included some detail which could be taken to suggest that the victim was at least partially responsible for enabling the violence. These details include things like mentioning that she'd been flirting with the perpetrator or accepting a ride home from a strange man. So while the lack of explicit victim blaming is certainly an exciting finding, we do need to be wary of how focusing on victims' behavior can still participate in subtle forms of victim blaming. Finally, we considered levels of sensationalism. International research has found high levels of sensationalism in the reporting of violence against women. And we found similar results, with 40% of our sample including such elements. We found sensationalistic elements tended to appear in the headline most often, and here we've included a couple of examples, a lot of them quite shocking. But on the positive side, unlike a lot of the international research, we found very few examples of salacious or titillating coverage, only 3%. I'll be concluding this presentation with some recommendations. The first set of recommendations are in relation to news content and correspond to the issues of context that I discussed earlier. So these are some basics for including useful context in the reporting of violence against women. The first step is just to include additional statistics. Also seeking violence against women experts for comment. Including information on support services mentioning the relationship between the victim and the perpetrator when legally able to do so. Avoid focusing on the victim's behavior. Acknowledge that the violence against women is not a private or individual issue and label it violence against women or gender-based violence. The second set of recommendations are focused on how to work together towards improved coverage of violence against women. Firstly, we need multi-stakeholder collaboration. Violence against women is not a problem that can be effectively addressed by one group. Rather, this issue needs to be addressed actively by many sectors working together. Collaborative activity can coordinate effort, maximize reach, and allow resources to be more effectively utilized.
Secondly, we need to strengthen the media skills of violence against women experts and leaders. Among the most troubling but also solvable issues found in our research is the lack of violence against women experts use of sources. Development in this area holds a lot of potential. Building the media skills of experts and leaders will increase the likelihood that they'll be used as sources, and therefore reporting will be more likely to include information about violence against women as a significant and preventable community problem. Lastly, we recommend continued research, development, and innovation in the media space. There's much potential in the contemporary media environment for new initiatives and developing innovative ways of communicating with the public about this issue. While we've certainly found a number of shortcomings in the way the issue is covered, there are many realistic avenues for improvement, and I believe these small steps can make a large impact. I've included a number of additional resources and information here for people seeking more information, and also references from the presentation. Thank you very much for your time.